um, Tony Giddens doesn't hesitate to take on very diverse, very large themes, social theory, reflexive modernity, intimacy and emotional life, climate change, and now AI, which indicates a wide, generous mind. And in this spirit, he taught sociology one in Campbell Hall at UCSB, co-authored books, textbooks, with several colleagues, sociology colleagues here, such as Rich Applebaum, Harvey M Molach. Um, so his bio includes a wide, generous mind that brings many people uh, together. So greetings and welcome to you all, sociologists of the world unite. Um, in many countries, I think maybe welcome to some from George Mason University, uh, maybe International Sociology Association, um, sociologists from many countries that are already on the screen that are more than I can list without wearing you out. Uh, a welcome to sociologists who are staying up late to join us. Ratna Nepal in Kathmandu, Tim Rackett in Phnom Penh, um, and to those who are joining us sober because they are doing Ramadan, also a welcome. Our best wishes for Berta Taylor, who is recovering at home. And um, to, those, to those who are joining us for this occasion, new, take into account, folks, this is a weekly occasion. Next week, this time, we are hosting Walden, Walden Bello. So a warm welcome to Tony Giddens and uh, Harvey Moloch. Um, a warm welcome. And then please, Tony, over to you. Thanks for joining us. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And let me say what a pleasure it is to be with you today back in Santa Barbara. Uh, I'm sure it's lovely and sunny there outside. I look out my window, it is dark and dank in London. So it's good to have this connection. Um, I'd like to thank Jan and uh, Brett Ahof and the Global Studies um, Department for inviting me. I'd like to congratulate you on this wonderful series, Jan, because quite amazing um, what you've got together in this series. And um, it's a signal achievement. So I'm very pleased to be part of it. I'm also very pleased to welcome Harvey Moloch. Um, as uh, an encounter with Harvey after I finished speaking, um, who has enjoyed a stellar career since I knew him way back in, so I won't say it, somewhere in the 1980s when I was a visiting professor at Santa Barbara. And uh, I must say, those were fun times because. We taught Social One together, and Harvey is just about the best public speaker I've ever come across. So I look forward to some trepidation to uh, our encounter after I've finished uh, speaking. Anyway, welcome everybody, and hello from London. Now, the pandemic is the backdrop to more or less everything at the current uh, period of time. Um, but many people, I feel, start from the wrong place in discussing the impact of the pandemic. They, they tend to argue as though the world was motoring along okay, and then suddenly the pandemic came along and disrupted everything, and that this is what we have to get to grasp. Now, of course, to some degree, this is true, but I want to argue a different point of view, that the pandemic is as much an expression of the huge changes which are rushing through our world as it is the consequences of them. It is crucial to understand that to grasp the nature of the pandemic and its likely implications for us. Um, this is, I think, de definitively not 
adjust the rerun of previous pandemics, but something in, in, in core respects quite different. Um, I call it, if you'll forgive me, the world's first digidemic. It, it sounds a trivializing term, but I mean in a very serious sense. Um, what I mean by this is that a range of factors are involved in the backdrop to the um, pandemic, um, but um, the digital revolution and AI runs through all of them. Um, so I want to, well, one of the differences with the past is simply the speed with which the pandemic has spread around the world, which has no precedent. Um, and we live in a world of 24 hour breaking news. I think that um, we haven't quite grasped the impact of 24 break, hour breaking news on people's consciousness. And this also is a, is a rather central feature of the nature of the pandemic um, as we experience it. Um, so the pandemic is, is a reflection of a massively integrated globalized world. And it, to me, it, it's a fundamental mistake, however, to see globalization as primarily economic. Many people do. Um, but to me, globalization is about interconnection. And the interconnection of the contemporary world is just massive. Um, if I'm a, I could be a Chinese migrant in London. I could uh, get on my mobile phone. I could uh, phone my family back in China, I could see them, and it would seemingly cost me nothing. It, this is a quite extraordinary level of global interconnection, so the speed has no precedent. Second, crucial point to me, our response has been deeply preemptive in a way that was simply not possible in previous episodes of epi epidemics. Think of what we are doing here. We are communicating digitally. We are keeping on in a way which was just not possible before. This is true of a whole range of people across the world uh, in many different contexts of work. Of course, it's not the only uh, aspect of uh, how we've controlled the pandemic because we all know the regulatory measures that have been put into place, but it is an absolutely cru crucial one because it's allowed so many businesses to carry on and to limit contacts which otherwise could have been um, deeply consequential. And if you uh, go back to the 1918 pandemic, there are many different estimates, you know, of um, the mortality rate. It could have been as many as 100 million out of 1.5 billion. Now, if you generalize that to a world of 8 billion, you can see what the outside consequences could have been in principle. Of, of a pandemic such as this. And we have contained it in, I think, a remarkable way in, in some ways with all the um, issues and glitches around the background. Third, the third point I want to make is the backdrop to this is a period of dazzling change. And I have, if you'll forgive me, my own term for this. I, I call it a world that has moved off the edge of history. By moving off the edge of history, I mean, our civilization is in a, in a moment, in a place where it hasn't been before. Moved off the edge of history, but still grounded in history. A core part of that is the digital revolution itself. And I've become absolutely absorbed with the digital revolution and AI over recent years because of its pervasive, intensive, and massively rapid impact. But it also includes transformations in geopolitics, uh, something like a huge shift, maybe the beginning of the Asian century, but certainly a relative decline of US and European power in the face of the rise of Asia and other changes. That's, that's a huge kind of potential uh, geopolitical shift. Crucially, for what I have to say later, accelerating climate change. Um, we've never, no previous generations have lived in a world where humanly created climate change is an existential risk to our civilization. And to me, that's what it is. And then equally huge changes in everyday life. I think of ethnicity, for example. 
big transformation transformations going on everywhere in the potential freedoms available to ethnic minorities. To me, if I might say so, the verdict in the Derek Chauvin trial yesterday was a signal moment, not just for the US, but for the world. The Black Lives Matter movement itself became global. It will get a new impetus now, I think. My own country, the UK, has to deal with its past too. It was the world's foremost imperial power for centuries. And the relics of that power everywhere, and they certainly stretch into various kinds of prejudices and forms of discrimination. Uh, universities here are quite deeply embroiled in all of this, since some of them have statues to pretty dubious colonial figures. President Bryden, therefore, was right, in my view, to call the verdict a giant step, in his words, in the march towards justice. And this is also something I feel which will reverberate around the world, perhaps as consequentially as the original uh, clash and incident which led to the whole thing. Now, how should we think about this emerging world? Well, there is a very famous uh, European theorist who was a close colleague of mine at the LSE for a period, and a friend of mine called Ulrich Beck. I don't know how well known he is in the US. But he said, we live in a new form of risk society where the risks we face are different, are more consequential, are more global than ever been before. Entirely correct, I think. However, my view is different from Ulrich's. Uh, I, I want to say we live in what I call a high opportunity, high risk society where you cannot do a stochastical analysis. You can't do a statistical analysis of where opportunity will prevail over risk, but uh, the opportunities are huge. Many of the opportunities we have are also uh, recent creations of this, this uh, period, uh, and they intersect with risk in, in many different ways. This, this is all part of my overall theme, if you like, of moving off the edge of history. And this is refracted, I think, back on the, the pandemic, if you look at um, the impact of AI, um, Chinese scientists decoded the genetic structure of the virus within 10 days of the outbreak. Uh, Chinese researchers then posted the genetic structure of the virus uh, on an open access website. We owe that to Professor Zhang Yongsen. And after that, there was a certain clampdown, but this was a wonderful thing he did. A whole range of vaccines have been produced across the world. This, this has never been done before. Scientists can communicate directly with each other across the world. They can, they can share databases. This is such a difference from what has happened in the past. And also, they, uh, the, the vaccines have been produced on a huge scale, a huge scale. Um, now, we all know the issues around all of this. We all know there are huge inequalities. We all know that there are um, mutations happening around the world. Um, the mutations um, come from uh, the uh, globalized nature of our world because they come from the, the contacts that are, are made. And uh, Greater Thunberg, the um, a uh, famous environmental activist who I, for one, greatly admire, um, speaks of vaccine hoarding, and uh, there's a, certainly a certain truth to this. Now, this is by way of a backdrop to my argument that um, we cannot just take the pandemic as something which has hit the world, but a pandemic which is in some large part created by our world. And it's um, against that backdrop that I want to run through some points on the future of work. Um, and I, I'll do these as briefly as I can, but I, I want to argue the future of work debate cannot be dislocated from these broader um, uh, changes. And to a large extent, it is a bit autonomous. Um, you remember that when originally we sent round the 
um, prospectus for this uh, series, uh, I mentioned in my blurb that uh, when I looked at uh, on a famous search engine whose name I won't mention, um, look up the future of work, I got, I think, 790 million hits a few months ago. Now, I checked just a couple of days ago, and it's two and a half billion hits. So a minimum one thing one can say is this is a global dialogue. This is a global uh, phenomenon, the, uh, the future of work debate. And uh, I have to confess, I only read a billion. So, you know, my uh, standpoint might be a bit inadequate. Um, anyway, um, against this backdrop, I want to make five main points about the future of work. Um, first, uh, we have to begin by grasping how much work has already changed in recent decades. Don't think, as I said before, everything was motoring along all right, and then the pandemic simply transformed everything. Uh, if you look at the stats 30 years ago in, for example, the UK or the US, some 10% of the labor force worked in agriculture. And remember, for most of history, most people worked in agriculture most of their lives. Uh, that proportion is uh, now down to 1%. 30% worked in manufacture. That proportion is now down to 8% and still dropping. Um, that is almost all the result of automation, not of offshoring. But these are huge changes already embedded in the system being hit by the pandemic. Um, and uh, the fact that today almost all jobs are in services is really crucial to the dilemmas um, posed by the pandemic. Um, the, this is um, not, you know, this is a sort of arena of the world where you have to meet up with other people. In, in service occupations, you have to be with others in some sense or another, or at least in many of them. So there are already really fundamental changes in the nature of work well before the pandemic come, came along. My second point, um, work is no longer the center of life. Even if for us as committed academics, um, or if you're in mid-career, it may feel that way. Uh, it's said in the media anyway that I saw that um, if you're at Goldman Sachs, um, you work a 95-hour week. Well, I suppose some academics I know work a 95-hour week and no doubt some of them are sitting here in this audience today. But if I uh, counterpose that with uh, the reality of our stats, and I ask how long does the average adult American work in paid work per week? The answer might surprise you. The answer is 15 hours. 15 hours, but as measured over the life cycle. Remember that people worked at one point across the whole life cycle. And it's an average stat and, um, you know, you could sort of dissent from aspects of it. The reasons are the wholesale expansion of education, the growth of part-time work, longer and ex increasingly expanding retirement and other factors. So work seems very central and it is, but it has retreated from life in terms of the overall lifespan already. Third, the big question that everyone is asking, as I sort of mentioned at the beginning, is how far will the changes created by the pandemic reshape the world when it is over? In other words, will people want to return to the office or work far more from home? But as I've already said in my introduction, uh, to me, this is the wrong question. The pandemic is really an expression of the huge transformations 
we have to adapt to in the world of work rather than the main origin of them. This will be a time of dislocation. We can all see that. But I feel strongly it is also a period of innovation and creativity. Think of what we are doing today. It is quite amazing that I'm able to chat to you across the oceans. It's quite amazing that Jan has been motivated to set up a series like this. It probably would not have happened before the um, pandemic came along. So, um, you know, this is a time of dislocation, but to me, it is a time also of huge uh, creativity. And uh, the mix of those things, you know, will be difficult to track through, but it's rather crucial to see that. And uh, I can, you know, many examples one can provide. For example, I've been on a kind of global tour in speaking, like most people or many of the um, professors sitting here. Um, I think I've been to about 10 countries without going anywhere over the past three or four months. Now, this is new. We didn't do this before. It's not simply going to go away, I think. The same thing is true of my parliamentary work. Um, the UK Parliament, you might not know, is pretty traditional. And when you vote in the UK Parliament, you have to go through the lobbies. You walk through the lobbies. Uh, and it, it can take you, you know, um, like 45 minutes to register a single vote. The Parliament has been, like many others, now working mainly digitally or not wholly digitally. There is a digital voting system. You can press a thing on your mobile phone and you can vote from home. This is almost, even in a traditional institution like the Houses of Parliament, this is probably not going to go away uh, uh, if the pandemic, if does in some simple sense, go away. These things are going to fuse into a different model. And I think this is true uh, all over the place in far more contexts than I can talk about here, of course. Fourthly, uh, as I've stressed before, the backdrop to much of this is AI and the digitalization of everything. Um, what are we doing today? We are communicating on Zoom. I don't know if you know the history of Zoom, but Zoom is only um, just over 10 years uh, old. It was founded by a Chinese entrepreneur, Eric Yuan. And it always interests me where innovation comes from. Um, I don't know if the story is ap apocryphal, but I believe it is not. Um, Eric Yuan was in China. His lady friend uh, lived a long distance away. He had to go on a 10 hour train journey to go and see her. And he thought there has to be a better way. And he wanted to invent a way, as he said, of being in the same room with the other, with the other person, not just communicating in an abstract sort of uh, fashion. Um, Eric Yuan, of course, now is uh, developed Zoom in California and uh, lives in California, but Zoom is quite an extraordinary story. It, you can't talk about the future of the work, I think, without mentioning Amazon, and that, that's the same kind of tale. This is truly amazing. You know, Amazon, by some counts anyway, just became the world's biggest company in an amazingly short period of time in historical terms. Um, it was driven from the beginning by AI and robotics. The fusion of human labor and AI robotics is absolutely central to Amazon and to so many other digital startups, um, you know, Uber, Airbnb, and the rest of them. So the uh, one face of the transformation of work is, is, is plainly that, but also, as we all know, the emergence of the gig economy because the workers in this system are, to some extent, the sort of servants of their AI uh, directors. And uh, so, you know, there are just gigantic struggles going on around the world, including in California, 
uh, around the gig economy, which won't be easy to resolve, but where I certainly myself um, support much greater workers' rights, but where there are plenty of dilemmas um, to be uh, involved. And um, all of this, you know, the, the knock-on effect of inequalities uh, has been accentuated by the pandemic. Uh, I'm sure many people in New Orleans will have seen the material on this. Women, uh, again, people from ethnic minorities, younger people more likely to have been furloughed and lost their jobs. This is true, not just in the US, not just in the UK, but on a very widespread level. So you can see the huge cluster of issues which is building up for us to discuss and uh, seek to resolve. Fifthly, a, a part of this new frontier, which we could certainly talk about in discussion, um, is what uh, Richard Baldwin calls globotics. And I would recommend his book on globotics, the globotics revolution to anyone who's interested in these issues. Um, many struggles and dislocations will <clears throat> focus all around this. Globotics um, is more than just telemigration. Telemigration allows us to sit somewhere and work anywhere across the world. And you have to ask yourself if I can do my job anywhere in the world, can anyone in the world do my job? Which is the counterpart, even for academics, um, that is to some degree the case. Um, globotics is more than just telemigration. It is the use of AI to uh, put a transformative layer on top of telemigration. Uh, therefore, the same kind of disruption that I described that's uh, sped through manual work um, a couple of decades ago or longer is now going through managerial and professional jobs and could perhaps uh, go right to the top. You know, a core part of what I'm saying is that we're off the edge of history, we're in a world of unknowns. We cannot say with any definitive uh, answer to many of the questions which, however, we must ask. These dislocations are certainly already affecting the professions, uh, where uh, quite a few professional occupations are outsourced uh, on quite a global level. Um, I'm particularly impressed by the work of Richard Suskind, that's S-U-S-S-K-I-N-D, uh, in the UK on the future of the professions. And he mentions many examples, for example, in the legal profession, uh, where there are online courts and uh, many such uh, phenomena, which are also uh, being uh, speeded up by the situation in the pandemic. So if you put this all together, it's just a huge, huge package of change, which adds to the sort of swell of change in the period I feel in which we're living. And there are so many issues, you know, I, I, I go over these things in an analytical way, but there are many, many aspects of discussion, which I hope could be raised uh, afterwards, or we could chat about some of them. Now, are there any counter trends? Uh, my answer is yes. And the counter trends are just huge. And this is a point, I think, of globally significant conjuncture, if, if you'll forgive me using a kind of uh, uh, rather exaggerated language, or I don't think it really is exaggerated. Um, if we come back to the panic, the pandemic, we all know it's a lesson in our, our own fragility. But it is far, far more than that when you pack it into the wider changes going in, in the world that I mentioned. And I think that does allow us to, to look at what's happening as a, a sort of gigantic counter reaction to some of these trends which could produce revolutionary changes in the world of work and elsewhere. 
uh, I think one can say with some confidence, this is the end of the neoliberal era, it, where neoliberalism means the idea that markets have the solution to everything, the markets are collectively more rational than most human beings can be. Uh, the neoliberal era has probably been the dominant ethos of the past 20 or 30 years. And this is therefore another huge change to pack onto the gas, at least in my view, it is. And uh, we know all about neoliberalism uh, in this country. We had Mrs. Thatcher. Mrs. Thatcher was a devotee of large scale transformation driven by uh, the marketplace. But uh, interestingly, like quite a few neoliberals, uh, somehow link that with an uh, inherent conservatism. And there is that contradiction there, I think, in political neoliberalism anyway. So I think it, this is not the end of the era of the importance of markets, of course not of market competition or anything like that. It is the end of a certain era though, I think of its intellectual and practical uh, dominance. Uh, what I mean by this is the activist government is back. It's back big time, and it's back on a, a sort of planetary level. Um, it, and I see this as something which just must be deeply connected to, which is not at the moment, I think, to the debate on the future of, of work uh, more abstractly. Uh, this is a huge, I think, and a pretty global transformation. Um, one major example of it is the EU Green Deal. Um, the EU Green Deal has been worked out um, in a pretty systematic and detailed fashion. The European Commission and the constituent nations have sanctioned it. So it's not just an abstract uh, phenomenon of the future. It is like a here and now phenomenon. It, it, it involves the expenditure of three trillion euros. Of course, uh, directed to recovery from the pandemic. Of course, that's part of uh, what it involves. But it is so much more than that. It's a proactive renewal of the welfare state. It's, uh, it is so on the large scale. Um, it is coupled to the reinvention of manufacture, and I want to make this a core part of my argument. There is at least the possibility of the renewal of manufacture through the transformations which we are witnessing insofar as they are focused on the core issue of climate change and environmental degradation. I'll come back to that a bit in the last bit of what I have to say. Anyway, in the, it is a, a core part of the European Green Deal. It, it's a process of reshoring, by the way, reshoring, um, because it's a process of being, bringing back jobs back to Europe. These will be jobs supposedly in renewable energy, electric cars, transformation of cities, and so forth. I would stress that in the Green Deal, these things are worked out in quite a lot of detail, um, which to me is pretty encouraging. Um, and of course, it's early days. We don't know how far this will have the impact, which I for one certainly hope it will. But it's also coupled to redistribution. It's uh, coupled to gender and ethnic inequalities. So it, it is a, a far ranging transformation. And if this is going on more globally, as I want to argue in some part, at least it is, this is like a potentially gigantic switch in history. Um, um, President Biden's initiative, as you know, is just about equally huge. Um, it's at a more um, preliminary stage politically, as we also all know but it involves the uh, expenditure of 2.3 trillion or more than that dollars. Um, it has the same overall motivation 
of a high degree of reshoring. Um, that is part of uh, the American Jobs Plan, which also is um, set up to have very large funding. And um, it's, it's part of an overall um, renewal um, strategy, just of you know, stratospheric size. You have to emphasize, we don't know how this will all turn out, but this is some kind of implicit reversal of history, I think, which converges not only with what some of the things that the world is desperate for, but um, which the pandemic curiously might be at least a little bit the stimulus to uh, driving us there. And don't imagine this is just the EU uh, and the US. In my country, the UK, even though Boris Johnson is a, not a left winger, um, he's planning uh, huge um, investments in infrastructure. He is deeply, deeply committed to COP26, <coughs> excuse me, which is happening in Glasgow. He is wholly committed to a radical uh, climate change agenda. So this is a really, really interesting transformation, whatever it uh, comes to. And you know, I think you can see the global um, spread of it if, if I just list a few other cases, because this is a global thing. Agreed as an experiment. Agreed, you know, these things haven't got very far. But um, if you look at the Saudi Green Initiative, um, is to plant 10 billion trees, 10 billion trees in the country um, to, in a short period of time, actually, to make renewables 50% of the country's energy by 2030. And this is a, you know, fossil fuel state. So, you know, this is um, extreme ambition. India, uh, suffering, as we know, greatly from the uh, uh, return of the virus at the moment, um, has got a, a green recovery plan of 35 billion um, of its currency on renewables. And then crucially, you have China's climate change plan. And uh, I mean, China, we know that there are many debates and dislocations going on around about this, but what has been achieved in China is staggering. Transformation of a poor rural society within about 35 years into an avant-garde uh, cutting edge industrial state. China, you know, and the Chinese can achieve things that have never been achieved anywhere else thus far anyway. And they have a, a, a very serious and detailed climate change plan, which has just been um, um, uh, set out. And it's crucial that China is now on board, I think, to negotiate, I think, with the United States and European countries, uh, because to me, climate change is, is an existential threat, as I've been saying all the way through, kind of fuses with the other transformations um, which are going on, but which humanity has no experience of before. The, the threat, to me anyway, I mean, I've written quite a lot on China, climate change and taken part in several COP meetings. It is genuinely right, as Greta does, to call it a, a um, climate emergency. There probably, there may only be 20 or so years before it's too late to go back um, sh short of some amazing technological innovations. So there's a very interesting little tale here I'd like to just uh, say uh, in concluding, because um, if you remember, Greta went to a meeting of world leaders uh, about a year and a half ago, and she turned up there and she said to them, look, in the pandemic, you've pulled out all the stops. You've energized yourself. You've got a global response. Why can't you do the same with climate change? There is just the chance. I mean, a lot of this is at the moment uh, plans rather than actuality, but there is just a chance that the pandemic may have inadvertently as a sort of unintended consequence 
generated the impetus which would allow us to deal with what is to me, as I said, possibly the most fundamental problem of our time in terms of <clears throat> at least potential existential crisis. Um, for anyone sitting in the audience who wants a sort of alert signal to climate change, I would recommend the book um, by my colleague in Cambridge, Peter Wadhams, who's the head of the Scott Polar Institute, and uh, one of the greatest experts in the world on uh, the polar region. Um, he wrote a book called A Farewell to Ice, which is sort of riven on my mind, in which he analyzes out how far it's gone, the melting of the ice, how close we are to a point of no return. So, if, you know, you could say of all the changes that have taken us off the edge of history, um, climate change is the most profound. Um, I leave you, if you'll forgive me, British fashion, um, with a couple of jokes. <laughs> um, they're not in very good taste, really, but um, two planets are chatting to one another. And one planet says, oh, I don't feel very well. And the other planet says, I think you've got Homo, homo sapiens, but don't worry, that doesn't last very long. <laughs> I told you it was in bad taste, but it is a kind of wake-up call. And the other joke is about uh, supercomputers, because AI has been the other theme of what I've had to say here. Um, a, a group of uh, scientists get together and they build a massive super quantum computer. Massive, massive, it takes them months and months and uh, when the quantum computer is finished, <clears throat> they switch it on and they ask the question they design it to answer, is there a God? And the supercomputer says there is now. Well, that's, that's not quite my view of how things are. But I do think that among the existential transformations of humanity, we are kind of merging with intelligent machines. And there doesn't seem to me to be any way back. And it does seem to me to be a sort of quasi potential stage of evolution. How many of you don't have your, uh, your mobile phones right by them? What do you feel when you, <clears throat> when you lose your mobile phone? You feel totally lost. Well, your mobile phone is a supercomputer which is more powerful than those that sent human beings to the moon 60 years ago. So it would seem to me there is a kind of existential moment for humanity, which is about the sort of fusion of our lives with intelligent machines. In a way that takes me back to my beginning. And I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. So much, uh, Tony, marvelous. Uh, please, Harvey, over to you. Um, I'll have to ask people to speak up because the sound on my computer seems to have suddenly almost disappeared. Yes. Um, Tony, uh, uh, thank you very much. I know uh, I speak for all of us uh, to uh, welcome you back, if uh, that's appropriate, <laughs> in various ways. Um, and to um, particularly welcome uh, what, what seems to me to be uh, a, a, a note of optimism and uh, uh, sorely uh, needed uh, by us all. And not um, to, to, to cite chapter and verse of pessimism, but um, your optimism is I think especially significant for us because we're aware of the very thin uh, uh, margin by which uh, our national regime uh, but only our national regime has been uh, um, uh, brought along and, and saved us from uh, th the most dire consequences that um, you, you've um, flagged um, as, as at least a possibility. Uh, so um, uh, it, we now have, based on your talk, the, the China hope which is that in order to uh, keep up with our competitor, 
we just may be dragged into something decent. Uh, it's, a, it's sort of a Chinese Statue of Liberty uh, in the American Harbor uh, that uh, in order to um, re remain in the running, uh, we have to now uh, follow the path of China. And uh, I, uh, I, I myself um, uh, am pleased by that, uh, by that potential. Uh, and um, uh, maybe you would have um, some more to, to say about that. Uh, I wanted to ask you though about, um, and, and the Chinese case uh, raises it as, in my mind as well. And that is um, the, the distribution, uh, this is a work question. Uh, the distribution of people's lives, um, particularly vis-a-vis -vis work um, and the, the arc of the work life, um, as well as the tedium of the work life um, determined by the geographic location of different kinds of work across the world, um, the distribution of shit work across the world, and what um, different uh, qualities of work will look like um, given the digitization uh, transformations. What will be good jobs as opposed to bad jobs? And it seems to me that the, the way you've laid it out, uh, encouraging us to new ways of, to, uh, to imagine futures, uh, it, it makes me want to think more about uh, what good work will look like. Uh, will it be gig? Will it not be gig? Will it be for certain times of life, not times of life? Is there such a thing as a working underclass um, uh, and, and differentially located in the world? How to advance our thinking along those lines at all? Maybe you want to respond to any of that for now. Sorry, the computer cut out your last bit. What did you say last bit? Um, how the uh, digitization at its various levels, the way it will meet human beings, um, in particular in their work life, will be distributed um, around the world in different kinds of ways than now. And, and how can we even um, start to imagine what that transformation will look like and be, be qualitatively uh, distributed? Well, I don't think you have to imagine all of it, Harvey, because a lot of it is already happening and will be an extension of existing trends. I mean, it's it's not what what we do is work, right? And um, I can't see that universities will simply stay the same after this episode. Of course, people will want to go back and be in physical lectures and will want to go to meetings and so forth. But uh, quite a lot of it will not go away, I think. And that will certainly include, I think, a much greater range of digital uh, communication such as we're doing today. And that might be extended by the use of virtual reality. I mean, I'm supposed to be speaking in a series later on in the year where they're using um, avatars. <laughs> And we speak through avatars who communicate. So there are all sorts of structural possibilities to that. But, you know, that's something that will affect universities pretty profoundly. And I think most um, aspects of the workplace, I think if you take universities, another example, there are, there are going to be probably quite profound changes of other sorts, which will happen to university institutions as a result of this. I mean, uh, for example, students certainly for the moment won't travel the world in which they did before. There might be a vast extension of online learning, I feel. Um, you know, the Open University has been in existence in the UK for quite a long while, and it sort of was a bit of a dead end. But I think we will, as in many other forms of workplace, get sort of new fusions of co-presence and uh, digital connection. And this will uh, certainly feed over into global research. I blooming well hope it does because 
a frontier of global research is climate change. And we need global collaboration um, to, to try and deal with this, to me, gigantic threat. So I think this, you know, this will be generic through many forms of workplace. I mean, just as we didn't predict the pandemic, you won't be able to predict all of these changes because many, the best changes are lateral, you know, people don't anticipate them. So I do see the world as one of huge change. And uh, if there is a transition out of the pandemic, I do see it as a period of reinvention. I do, for the reasons I've mentioned, still see it as a period of tremendous risk alongside that. Um, on the question, you know, the thing I tried to avoid, the thing that everyone seems to be asking about the future of the work, do people want to go back to the office? Well, I mean, for someone, you know, like you who works on urbanism, it's a really important question because that affects property values and all sorts of things. And you can see many potential changes happening in city centers, although I feel they'll converge with the ones I mentioned because um, in London, you know, you've got ecological programs whereby cars are basically not allowed to go into parts of London they were previously. So you've got pedestrians and cyclists and so forth. So, uh, you know, this is going to be a, a multiplex uh, process, but amazingly interesting, I think. And this kind of fusion reinvention will never be total. I mean, you know, I'll come back to Irving Goffman, who I also had the privilege to know at UCLA, who to me was the greatest sociologist of all time, really, who talked to the compulsion of co-presence. The compulsion of co-presence is still there. You know, much as I love looking at a picture of you and talking <laughs> through a computer where the sound appears to be fading, um, I would like to have a drink with you sitting on the beach in Santa Barbara or whatever. So those kinds of mixes will still be there, but I do feel it will be a period of transformation, yes. And I do feel quite a lot of it will be positive. And I do think the workplace will be systematically reinvented. My hope is that it can be made to converge with a program of social justice, a program of reducing discrimination, a program of increasing the rights of women. Um, because if you just take the simple question of you know, the reading the newspapers a million times in the year, will you go on working at home? Will you go to the office? I mean, a fusion is obviously very positive for women who still bear the burden of childcare and want to carry on working from home. So overall, I would want to feel that these changes can be fused with a positive, democratic, innovative, egalitarian, political motivation too, but maybe that's asking too much. So I think that um, it, if I'm right about this, that it might be time to uh, open this up to the audience, yes. Jen, is that that possibility? Yes, exactly. Uh, uh, and, I, and have to, I have to warn everybody, um, my computer, you know, has got this connection to the parliament and for some reason it's caused another glitch in the sound system. So you're all like a whispering mouses, mice to me. So. Well, all right then, let me speak up, uh, folks, a practical point, uh, Tony has to join Parliament in uh, one forty-five, so we have a limited time, let's group questions, I see a question from Rich Appelbaum, and we can combine that with a question from Mayfair about surveillance, and then there are two others following that. Please. So, Tony, maybe our avatars can get together for a drink. Yeah, I could ask yeah. you all to shout. Yes. Another so, feature of the digital age when it lapses. So, a couple of points I want to make. Um, your optimism is great, um, and it echoes Marx's prediction in the Grundrisse that technology would replace labor and we'd all be. A, you know, hunters and poets, the German ideology, all of that. So I wonder if you do see a time somehow where the, you know, work week globally will be replaced by, um, you know, by machines and we can all be 
poets and writers. I also want to raise a couple of negatives. Um, and one is- I just answer sure. that. Can I answer that question first, Rich? Otherwise I'll sure. probably um, won't go on to the second because, um, can you just repeat the last bit of it? Is will, will human beings become redundant really? Yeah, right. And well, I, mean, I, um, I think the answer to that is no. Um, at least in the foreseeable and relatively immediate future. I mean, for anyone interested in a specific field, narrow field of the future of work, uh, MIT had, I think, a study that went on for two years about the impact of AI and automation on the workplace. There's a lot of detailed uh, literature on that for anyone interested in, in those reports. They come to the conclusion that there will actually be a continuing high demand for human labor, that this will apply globally. And that although you'll get something like the various fusions I've been talking about, at least in the limited time frame when we can predict anything in this world that has moved off the edge of history, um, intelligent machines will not make human labor anywhere close to redundant. On the whole, I accept that because it's not just machines we're dealing with, it's other people. And there are the things that I mentioned, the compulsion of co-presence and so on. But what we do have is a synthetic world, you know, which, which is part of us trotting off the edge of history. As I say, we are immersed in a world of intelligent machines. We don't even think about it, but it is our new existence. And, you know, that, that will uh, presumably accentuate, especially once you're able to do brain implants and all the rest of it, but that's a long way down the, future, the line. But for the next little while, I would accept the findings of the MIT report, which I think is pretty thorough and detailed. Quite a lot of it is written by David Autor, whose work I much admire, who's one of the best writers on a global um, trade. Thank you. My uh, other question on the negative side, I mean, globalization was supposed to bring us closer together economically. We won't go to a war with China because they're making the goods we consume. But now there's been a resurgence of geopolitics. And I wonder if that is a negative side that you see. Um, a, you know, a trade war with China escalates into something else. Um, countries doing their own thing, going back to uh, before Bretton Woods. Um, absolutely, it is as a potential, yes. And that is part of the story of our times. You know, our capability of dealing with these issues might depend on how far that becomes a really dramatic uh, conflict. Um, that you, you probably know, but uh, some part of that division between China and potential division between China and chunks of the rest of the world actually was sort of fueled by the rise of AI. I don't know if people in the audience know about that, but there's a really uh, fantastic book by Kai-Fu Lee called AI Superpowers, which is about that. Um, when I was on this parliamentary committee, we went to see the people at DeepMind. DeepMind invented a supercomputer that beat the world champion at Go, a game much, much more complex than chess, caused a sensation in Asia was watched by hundreds of millions of people, but riveted itself in the Chinese consciousness. And China said, we must compete. China said, we must become the world leader in AI. That is a core part of Chinese government strategy. And as I said, one of the things I deeply admire about China is that it gets things done. I, I think in this context, in the context of, of climate change, I do hold out the very possibility this is a real ray of hope for humanity. But this is a, you know, there are huge geopolitical tensions here. And of course they converge with other geopolitical tensions, viz Russia, to some extent India. So complex situation, but I certainly think that um, uh, there is, there is, this is a, you know, from so many reasons I said, a, a crux of history and AI geopolitics as I heard at the very beginning, deeply involved in that. Uh, please, over to Mayfair. 
Hello, Tony. Long time no see. Yes, indeed. Okay. Lovely to see you. Okay. And so, just about hear you. Okay, I'll talk louder. So my question is uh, regarding surveillance because China is ascendant in AI. Surveillance, facial recognition, all that has been uh, to a certain extent uh, deployed by the state. So now that China is uh, uh, technologically do uh, almost dominant in that, I, I see dangers. And then uh, the other issue is. Uh, Can I answer that one the first? Nation right state. Could I answer that one? Could I answer that one first? Okay, go ahead. Um, yes, all this is a, is a core part of what we're talking about because China has a state-driven system. Um, which does operate through, I have to say, a large degree of popular consensus because of what's been achieved, fused with, uh, you know, pretty generic market economy, which huge digital companies, which the state, however, will confront if they go beyond a certain border. And um, as you say, digital surveillance is a core part, as it were, of the Chinese way of life and is built into the system. Face recognition is in turn a core part of that. And of course, that you know, has worrying edges to it. On the other hand, um, we know that uh, in some sense, the virus originated in China. I don't think through anybody's fault whatsoever. It was a result essentially of deforestation. It, it connects with um, actually climate change issues again. Um, but uh, China has also mounted a, a massive response and um, so I think the Chinese model is quite mixed, but yes, surveillance is a, is a huge part and it's kind of built in everyday life because, you know, you go on Alibaba or something, you know, state picks up all the data. And um, that's where the situation is. Of course, how it will evolve further, one cannot quite say. Uh, there are very strong elements of surveillance in Western countries too. For those who don't know it, we have kind of neoliberal model of surveillance. For those of you who don't know um, um, the, the book on um, surveillance capitalism, um, that, that is the best book uh, on these issues, I think, uh, Susanna Zuboff. And we live in a surveillance society too, but it's, this is neoliberal and it's driven by advertising. You know, more or less everything you do is recorded and sent off to advertisers. You could, if you use a, a major search engine whose name I again I won't mention, you know, you can um, cut off uh, that data sourcing for a little while and then they immediately ask you to do it again. So you can't really function too well that way. This is a deep, deep suited surveillance society, but driven perversely by the mechanics of neoliberal capitalism by advertising. I don't think we even are wholly conscious of how deeply advertising has been driven into our lives. And I don't find that a happy situation. I don't want all my data sent to all these bloody companies, even if I might be interested in some of them. So I don't think the situation is totally different from that in China, except obviously the role of the state is different. Sorry, what was your second uh, question? Um, so it's uh, w with this um, sort of weakening of Western powers, do you think in the West, given China's success at uh, controlling the pandemic with a very strong centralized state, there will start to be questioning within the West about the advantages of this kind of ultra individualism and um, libertarianism? Well, I think uh, it's more accurate to say there will be a range of conflicts and dislocations around that as are actually happening already because you cannot actually control uh, coronavirus without a significant role uh, for data management. A good deal of that data management has to be in the hands of the state in some sense of the term state. And therefore surveillance is in that sense, a key part of handling the pandemic. I mean, you want people to be tracked. People voluntarily agree to be tracked mostly uh, because they know it is a wider social 
uh, consequence. So you do have a whole series of issues lined up here, that's for sure. Um, I'm not sure that it will lead towards a, uh, anything like an authoritarian surveillance type state, however, because of the different composition of the Western countries. But as we all know, there's fertile grounds for conflict here. And many such conflicts are going on because, for example, you know, I'm a believer in freedom of speech. I'm a believer in the right to mobilize. So I have some sympathy with people who came into the streets in Germany and protested against the wearing of masks. I don't think it's something I would agree with, but I think you should have the right to protest. So finding, treading a line between those two things, you know, is going to be pretty difficult in the immediate future. Um, but I, I think it can be done. And um, I mean, we must, we must, I feel somehow, you get to get to grips with these existential issues because this is a civilization on the edge, I think. I, I think climate change is a big part of it, by no means the only part. On the other hand, it's a civilization which is gigantically successful. So it's that set of contradictions which we have to tread the line. That's why I like the phrase off the edge of history, because we can learn some things from history, obviously, certainly about the role of tyrants and the role of demagogic leaders, etc. But mostly we're on our own. You know, you can't draw too much on past history to resolve the biggest issues, biggest issues we face. So I think that's also an institutional struggle. That's also a challenge. It's also incidentally a challenge to universities, I think, to rethink their role, because I think universities have to be geared. Uh, to practical consequences uh, as part of the consequence of the world in which we're living in, even though I completely accept intellectual autonomy and the autonomy of intellectual inquiry. So this is a world up for grabs and um, yeah, we have to find a path through it as I've been suggesting. Thanks. Um, please, Bernoussi and then Ashish. Lucy, ah, there you are. Yes, hello. Um, thank you. Hi there. Uh, thank you for this series, Jen, and thank you for your fantastic talk. Uh, so I'm Z from Morocco, and I was wondering if you can tell us a bit about how uh, this rise of artificial intelligence can affect um, your important uh, proposition of ontological security when thinking about human security. So I, I was I thought of that because I really like your joke about the supercomputer taking the role of God. Um, so <laughs> on that, uh, actually, uh, would that create maybe something like um, uh, well less othering between different groups of humans because we will feel all equal uh, compared to these so-called machines or maybe some new forms of othering and marginalization. Um, could you just take me back to the first bit of your question about AI, I'll start with that. Um, so how uh, does it affect uh, this, the idea of ontological security? So a psychological uh, security of human beings, maybe uh, also uh, linked to an existential crisis, right? Oh, you said uh, ontological security, yeah. Yes. Yeah, no, that was a notion that I used to deploy, ontological security, yes. Well, I, you know, AI, as I've tried to say, is perhaps, the, well, certainly along with climate change, one of the biggest changes that's ever happened to humanity, I feel. I don't think that's too exaggerated to say that. It does depend on how you actually define it, because... It's um, elusive to define in the end, but you're talking here of super intelligent machines, not just out there, but to some extent in here. That's why I use the example of mobile phones. I mean, you cannot live without your mobile phone, I think, basically. And as I said, it's not a phone. It's a highly intelligent being geared into a, a kind of global system of satellites, you know, so... Um, there is a, a existential tension there, but you, I don't think you can have a general answer to that question. It has to be political and institutional. We have to have democratic ways of, of, of regulating and um, 
delivering democratic goods in a, in a world where AI and the digital revolution have simply upended large chunks of our lives. I don't think that's impossible, but it's certainly not uh, straightforward. So uh, there, I just feel these questions are so interesting though. And I think ontological security is quite a good thing to mention because that's part of it, I think, was um, our, our sense of everyday security is certainly quite different in the pandemic, but also I think in the context of, well, you don't know where it's going. You have problems that we have to solve which humanity is not confronted before. You just have to think, you know, what kind of world is that? And some of these problems are deeply existential. So that's the kind of world I'm trying to map out. You might have guessed that I'm trying to write a book called Off the Edge of History, the world in the 21st century, although uh, I'm finding it a bit of a struggle, but I certainly um, think you put your finger on some key issues there. Uh, but we have the chance to think them through, I think. Please, over to Ashish, uh, thanks, uh, uh, Z. Uh, over to Ashish, please. Uh, th thank you, Tony. This has been a fascinating talk. Uh, I have a question, uh, pulling on one of your counter trends and thinking about, about future of work. Um, so one of the things you sort of s we see is labor moving out of manufacturing, labor moving out of agriculture, at least at the national level. Um, the result is more in, more Western, in Western developed and Eastern developed states. Yes. Y yeah. Yes. OK. Um, more and more people piled up in the services sector. The services jobs that are offshoreable are also disproportionately automatable. And what that seems to leave us with increasingly is uh, jobs that are left particularly in the West, but I'm I, I think this is true in the developing world too, uh, that are not offshoreable. And therefore, a labor market in which governments have the ability to actually intervene more actively, improve working conditions, improve wages, more so than they have before, because the labor markets, in some sense, there's a deglobalizing counter trend. Question is, and, and it seems, seems that this may have some political implications. You start to get success on the fight for 15, things like that, right? Uh, teacher strikes, etc. So does this sort of coincide with this idea of the end of liberalism, a neoliberalism where you actually might start to see states intervening to more actively improve labor conditions in the non-tradable sectors of the economy? Could you just summarize that question a bit? Yes. Yeah. Do, do, do you think the shift of work into non-tradable sectors of the economy leaves more room for states to intervene to improve working conditions and for social movements to push states to do that? Um, the answer is yes, I think, but not just because of changes going on in the workplace or in manufacturing and so on, but because of the larger conjunction in the world that I was describing. You, you're seeing, uh, I think, a massive potential return of the state there uh, as an active instrument of governance. And as I've tried to say, that feeds directly into the world of work because you must deal with the issues that I mentioned if we're gonna essentially save our civilization, in my view anyway, and sort of on the ground, the aspect of that is, is the recreation of work environments and the recreation to some extent of global manufacturing in a different form oriented towards renewable energy, and probably, uh, you know, a, a different kind of overall global philosophy somewhere along the line there. And that's where I think Western countries can learn from Asian countries and can learn from other countries across the world what kind of overall philosophy that would be as we encounter this series of transformations. I would still say that, you know, I'd still put opportunity before risk I, I'm not saying like Ulrich did that this is well simply driven by risks. I think there are many, many opportunities in this area you described. And in a longer debate, you know, we could tease some of those out. But I still feel that even though that we're in a world of unknowns, there, there are huge potential and positive changes happening. And I feel that could affect universities positively in some ways 
like I said, as well as cause them problems. So, I mean, a lot of issues come together here. Uh, Tony, I, if, you know, in its way, it's a truly absorbing uh, moment of human history, I think, too, in spite of all its dangers and potential catastrophes. If time permits some more questions, uh, John Foran, Hank Overbeek, I also have a question. Can Brexit survive the edge of history? Jan, do you mind if I just have two more questions? Because, because of this security system, it seems to be system, your sound system on my computer is not doing too well. Of so, course, brief. So parliament, you know, the parliament is somehow putting its um, paw in here. So I see. Um, I'm struggling to keep up with the questions. Uh, John Foran, do you want to ask a question? Sure, it'll just take one minute and it's not even a question. And I apologize, Tony, for having to come late to the talk. Well, very nice to see you and hear from you. Likewise, for sure. The elephant in the room, I think, is politics and social movements. We're living with a very short timeline to something that's going to look like runaway climate change. So I think that the climate crisis and its allied crises, the democracy deficit, the logic of global capitalism, the cultures of violence that permeate our lives, the unending pandemics to come, and the racism that the Floyd uprising has foregrounded has to be on our minds all the time and push those of us who see this, and there are many of us, and it is we, the peoples of the world, the young, the frontline communities, the citizens who see themselves as Earth citizens, who logically must and probably will be the drivers of saving humanity and much of the non-human world. It's on all of us to wake up now, to connect the dots, to learn to love and act together and to do things in some radically new ways. Thank Let you. Let me say, um, I would have been proud to make that statement myself because that more or less summarizes how I feel about the state of the world. And I think you put it very accurately because what you've described there is precisely, you know, an intermix of, of positives and negatives that we have to deal with. And I think it's up to us collectively, individually, to sort our way through these, recognizing, however, that you can't draw too much on the past to do so. And I think you could focus any of them down if you wanted into particular institutional contexts. And I suppose I would even again give universities an example. How should universities respond? How are we going to reshape them? Are we going to be able to uh, deliver knowledge to a global audience? Are we going to be able to contribute to this uh, quasi-existential crisis uh, which we face? Or I, th I think that universities should be pioneers in some of these things that they have in the past, but I very much agree with uh, the way in which you've sketched out that um, classification of dilemmas and possibilities. What it means is we need people like you and other people, you know, to produce the kind of avant-garde thinking um, which at this point I think we have to have and some of that has to break fairly bravely from established traditions of thought, I feel. Um, but we're in a kind of global experiment with humanity, I think, which we've somehow designed ourselves. <laughs> and, um, that's why we have to try and be pioneers. We're in a new land, we're in a new universe. But I re would repeat the issue, you know, the question that in our personal lives, and in our global uh, futures, it is a huge mix of opportunities and risks. And we, we all have the chance, I think, collectively, individually, to plot a positive path through it, while recognizing there are catastrophic risks uh, along the way. But thank you very much for those observations. Please, final question, Hank Overbeek, Amsterdam. Thank you very much for, for your wonderful talk. And let me just raise an observation on a point you made a little bit earlier um, of the current crisis possibly spelling the end of neoliberalism. And um, 
if if neoliberalism is about the rule of markets, then uh, I agree that you might be right. But if neoliberalism is first of all, as for example, Quinn Slobodian has has argued, is first of all a political project to uh, disempower the working class and the left, then it would seem to me that the uh, AI society is the ultimate version of neoliberalism. What would you say to that argument? Yeah, I think you're entirely right. And I would do the same thing to separate economic from political neoliberalism. On the other hand, the two have quite often historically been tied as was the case in Thatcherism, I think, in, in my country. Um, I think, it, it, uh, yes, it's the end of the period of economic neoliberalism as a dominant global ideology. I don't see any way back for that, even though, of course, the, the all sorts of issues to be resolved and all sorts of difficult paths to tread ahead. But we can make, I think, positive gains from that. that that's not the same as saying we don't need a substantial role for economic markets, which would be absurd. Because of course we do. We need financial markets. We need them to function effectively. We need to some sense marketize environmental issues if we're going to motivate people to deal with them. So I'm not decrying the role of markets, but there is a new synthesis emerging, I think, and that is absolutely necessary. I think you're right to separate that from directly political neoliberalism because, um, you know, I used to teach at the LSE. The LSE was where von Hayek was. You know, he was the pioneer, if you like, of um economic neoliberalism or if you want to call it that and the political version is different and i mean i'm a social democrat and i'm a believer in the active role of the state i'm a believer in the need for active redistribution um i want that to be achieved while still at the same time generating uh, local and global solutions to the climate crisis because i see that as perhaps the overriding crisis of humanity at the moment i know that view is not shared by everybody, but having worked, I think, fairly deeply in the field, that, that's my view. This is a limited time span that we have to cope with this. So, you know, it's just, just it's a huge chance to fuse all these things together. But my view is it can be done, but a lot will depend on contingent political outcomes. So a lot will depend on, on this uh, geopolitical tension between China, the United States and Europe, for example in concrete versions of this, but I think you're right to separate those two dimensions. And I'm, I'm certainly not decrying a role for markets. I would stress that I'm not an advocate of state direction of anything. I don't, I don't believe in that either. Um, that was the point of what 20 years ago I called the third way. I've abandoned the term because it became kind of um, trivialized by people and I felt um, sort of didn't really understand what I meant by it, but I would still hold to that view. You need a creative mix of government power and market agency with a whole range of other intermediate organizations between the two, both at a local level, a state level, and a global level. Thank you very much for the question, though. Tony, uh, Malin... The last question. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, no, this is, this is just a rounding off, I think, Tony. A tribute to Ulrich to mix risks and opportunities and strive to a, to a new balance. What a wonderful talk. What a wonderful occasion. Thanks to you, to Harvey, and to Brad, and to all of you. Marvelous occasion. Thanks much. Cordial thanks. Wonderful for me to experience it too and to see all of you together on this screen. And I do apologize for the difficulties of the audio system, but it made it even more interesting. And I got even closer. To you. <laughs> all right. M many thanks. Fun, thanks. And goodbye, everybody. Goodbye, yeah. Tony. Goodbye, Harvey, Brett. I